Thank you all for coming back, for joining us anew. Um, I wanted to, I want to thank uh, Natalie Diaz and Dwayne Betts for that incredible reading and for bringing their art form into this space. Um, and Sarah's telling me to speak more. Yes, can you all hear me? Um, can it go any higher? Um, so for bringing their, their art form into this space and um, we need to promise them that it will be a brick as a brick and not a curtain. Um, so I, I am Karen Engel. I uh, just welcomed some of you here, but um, I'm putting on a slightly different hat now. Um, and that is to welcome you to the fifth annual Francis Tarleton Sissy Farenthold Endowed Lecture in Peace, Social Justice, and Human Rights. The lecture will be delivered by Ruth Wilson Gilmore, who, though she needs no introduction, will receive one shortly. <laughs> um, I want to begin this part of the program by recognizing the person who's really responsible for us being here tonight, and that's Sissy Farenthold, who's sitting on the front row here. Um, Sissy and her daughter, Emily Farenthold, join us from Houston tonight, as does her son, George Farenthold, who flew in from Washington, D.C. Um, and those of you who know Sissy know that she is first and foremost a grassroots activist who has long been involved in anti-military, anti-racist, anti-poverty, feminist, pro-environment, and pro-labor work. I'm proud to say she's a graduate of this law school, um, and she was once a Texas legislator representing South Texas. In 1972, she nearly became Texas governor. Wouldn't it have been nice? Um, and when that didn't happen, she came in second to be McGovern's vice presidential running mate. Imagine what that might have been like. Mm -hmm. She went on to serve as the first chair of the National Women's Political Caucus, the first female president of Wells College, co-organizer of the Women's Peace Tent at the World, UN World Conference on Women in Nairobi, and an international human rights activist, which manifested and continues to manifest in many forms, um, but partly manifested in her roles as chair um, of the board of the Institute for Policy Studies in DC and the Rothko Chapel in Houston. And she's been a very important friend as well, both personally, um, and, and, and to the Rappaport Center and a terrific advisor. So this endowed lecture is the result of a collaboration between the Rothko Chapel and the Rappaport Center in which we present the lecture in alternating years at each of our locations um, with the aim of ensuring continued engagement with both Sissy and with her ideas. You'll hear more about the Rothko Chapel's interest in the program in a moment from David Leslie um, who's the executive director of the Rothko Chapel. Um, I'd like to recognize him briefly, just you'll see him in a second. Um, as well as Ashley Klemmer, um, who moved back. Um, Ashley Klemmer, who's the program and community engagement director. Um, and they work with us each year, as well as with Sissy, to select the lecturer. And I'm grateful also to the many friends of Sissy and of the lectureship who have donated generously to make it possible, um, including many who are here tonight. So thank you all. Now here's our criteria for the lectureship. And you have it in a brochure. Um, in line with Sissy's own history of exposing and responding to injustices and inequality as both a public servant and citizen, the lecture series will bring internationally renowned scholars and activists, and tonight we have someone who is both, who will inspire their audiences to think and act creatively to respond to some of the greatest challenges of the 21st century. It is a demanding call, but it is everyday practice for Ruth Wilson Gilmore. One of the reasons that we selected Pro Pro Professor Gilmore for the lecture tonight and that I suspect she might have chosen us, 
is because of the commitment she and Sissy share to uncovering and attacking the multiple complexly related racialized and gendered structures that produce and maintain massive unequal distribution of wealth and power. I've already suggested ways that Sissy has done that throughout her career and through a variety of social movements. Um, Sissy's also been outspoken, I want to add, against the death penalty and against over-incarceration for many years. Back when she was in the legislature, she introduced a bill for the decriminalization, I should say she, she introduced a bill unsuccessfully, um, for the decriminalization of marijuana possession, largely because of the way its criminalization was disproportionately used against people of color. She also was a police abolitionist in her day. Yes. <laughs> Indeed, some attribute her loss in the gubernatorial race <laughs> to her call for the abolition of the Texas Rangers. <laughs> and she really did that. She called the Texas Rangers a, quote, festering sore <laughs> for the damage they wrought, especially to Mexican Americans in South Texas. As Calvin Trillin wrote in the day, the only thing she could have done to alienate some voters more was to, quote, launch a vitriolic personal attack on John Wayne. <laughs> I'm not sure that was beneath her, <laughs> um, but she didn't quite do it. Um, I hope I've given you a sense of how CISPI has inspired this event directly and indirectly. So I now invite David Leslie, Executive Director of the Rothko Chapel, to say a bit from the chapel's perspective. And after he speaks, my colleague and co-director, Professor Neville Hode from the English department will introduce Professor Gilmore. We'll say, here's Ruthie. <laughs> uh, building off of Karen's insightful and comprehensive introduction, I want to add my personal thanks to Sissy Farenthold, who throughout her life, as Karen noted, has modeled the consistency of presence an important life commitment necessary to effectively exposing and responding to injustice and equality wherever they may be found. I can personally testify that if you are blessed to be in her presence and caught up in her realm of influence, you will learn to be more creative, graceful, and tenacious in your advocacy and better equipped to address the world's greatest human rights challenges. It is also for me, important for me to elaborate just for a moment upon her credentials and commitments through her service to the Rothko Chapel, both in the past as board chair and now as a lifetime member of the board. Sissy constantly reminds us that while solutions to many of the world's human rights challenges rightfully lie in the courts, legislative bodies, and regulatory agencies, there is an existential spiritual crisis at the root of most of these problems that must also be addressed. For example, if I deny your personhood, your inherent worth, and your very existence, it is difficult, and maybe not even necessary, to create a community ethic and functional equitable rule of law that preserves and guarantees a person's essential legal protections and rights. Central to Sissy's commitments in the mission of the Rothko Chapel is a commitment to join with others, like the Rappaport Center, to make sure that amidst the politics of the day, we never forget our individual and collective humanness and worth, always ready to challenge and push back on those powers and principalities that work to convolute, deny, and destroy these eternal truths. Which leads us to this year's Sissy Farenthold Lecture, Meanwhile Making Abolition Geographies, presented by Ruth Wilson Gilmore. As we discovered, and maybe even rediscovered, when the Rothko Chapel presented its 2017 symposium, an act of justice undoing the legacy of mass incarceration. The criminal justice system in this country has a tenacious ability to do all it can 
to strip people of their human rights and dignity, reducing a person with a name and a history to a number, a state of non-personhood. Solitary confinement cells, courts that sentence children as adults, correctional units without air conditioning, and stockholders who demand a greater return and greater dividend on their investment in private prisons, even if it means cutting meals, health care, and security staff, ultimately impact all of us. And as such, it's easy to become complicit, if not a bit despondent. Thankfully, however, as we also learned, we are invited, encouraged, and presented numerous opportunities to change our perspectives and our practices. What we experience today does not have to be tomorrow's future. As we also discovered through our work on ending mass incarceration, efforts like those of Professor Gilmar are being made to dismantle a system every day that is tearing at the social fabric, if not the soul of our nation. Professor Gilmour, we are really grateful for your presence with us today. I also want to say thanks to our poets this afternoon that start us off with the soul, not necessarily just the head, but the soul, to remind us of this reality. That uh, we are grateful for your presence and for this conference to help heighten our level of awareness and provide fuel to our collective advocacy efforts so that what we see so often becomes no more. I want to close my introductory remarks by offering a special thanks to Karen Engel, uh, Daniel Brinks, who I, this is an interesting sort of transitioning out as a co-director, although not leaving the university, and welcoming somebody who's well involved in the university setting, but now with the Rappaport Center, Neville Hode, all your staff colleagues and interns. Let's give them a big hand of applause for all the work you do here at UT. And uh, I just want to invite you to take a moment to look at the annual report, because that is very impressive. And I think it helps to give us a sense of just what happens here every day. And I, too, want to add my thanks to my colleagues, uh, particularly Ashley Clemmer and Kelly Johnson and our program staff that work so hard to make sure these programs that we do together, as, the, as well as what we do at the chapel, are successful, meaningful, and impactful. Thank you all for all your hard work. <laughs> and finally, I will just add my closing thanks again to Sissy for allowing us to honor you with this lecture and for all that you do to promote justice and human rights throughout the world. Thank you. OK, I'm going to read fast because we want to hear from Ruth Wilson Gilmore. Um, it is an honor, a privilege, and a delight to welcome Ruth Wilson Gilmore back to Austin. That said, I wish it were a much missed colleague and friend making this introduction. Barbara Harlow, the Lou Anne and Larry Templeton Professor of English at the University of Texas here at Austin, who died in January 2017. Barbara Harlow was a friend of long standing of Ruth Wilson Gilmore a comrade and an ally in some of the most urgent political causes of our time, and one of the most lucid and insightful scholars of prison writing in the 20th century. Professor Harlow was also a member of the steering committee of the Rappaport Center since it began. She served as an interim director one semester, and when she knew she was dying, decided to leave as a member of the circle of friends of this endowed lectureship because of her respect for Sissy and her work, and her appreciation for the dialogue the lectureship had already sparked. She would be overjoyed by Ruthie's agreement to deliver the lecture. And were she here physically, she could do this much better than I can. But in the necessity of continuing after loss, personal, political, institutional, you get me. In another life, I was an Oscar Wilde scholar. Wilde was a figure whose own checkered career landed him in prison, and he ended his life a prison reform advocate, maybe even a prison abolitionist. Long before he went to prison, Wilde wrote, and I quote, a community is infinitely more brutalized by the habitual employment of punishment 
than it is by the occasional occurrence of crime. He had a way with words. In this aphorism, Wilde offers moral, almost metaphysical objections to criminalization, which still resonate with me. But as I introduce you to arguably the leading abolitionist thinker of our times, I must suggest that Professor Ruth Wilson Gilmore offers more wide-ranging, historically convincing, and morally persuasive arguments for prison abolition perhaps even for the abolition of criminalization itself as a central pillar of statecraft, and for the need for new imaginations of the political and other answers to the deeper problem of how humans as social animals are to live together. Many of these arguments are laid out in Golden Gulag, Prison, Surplus, Crisis, and Opposition in Globalizing California, which if you haven't read it, you need to. Uh, one of my jobs as a professor is to give you bibliography, bump it up. <laughs> it's a sui generis tour de force of a book that shows how prisons are central to social and political organizations, not ancillary. As she puts it, and I quote again, the practice of putting people in cages for part of or all of their lives is a central feature in the development of secular states, participatory democracy, individual rights and contemporary notions of freedom. These institutions of modernity shaped by the rapid growth of cities and industrial production faced a challenge, most acutely where capitalism flourished unfettered to produce stability from, and she's quoting Foucault here, from the accumulation and useful administration of people on the move in a society of strangers. So actually prisons aren't accidental to the project of modernity. And I mean, we heard other speakers talk about how actually the carceral state affects all of us differentially, you know, even if we think it doesn't. All right, we had over 400 registrants for this conference. It was slightly terrifying. <laughs> I'm glad to see not all of you are here. <laughs> and I trust that the process of weeding out has been the right one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's by far the largest number in the Rappaport Center's 15 years of running a conference on what we think are the most pressing human rights issues of the day. Okay, from that small piece of information, I cautiously deduce that abolition now may be an idea whose time is imminent. Mm. The New York Times, not exactly a reliable bastion of radicalism, <laughs> no matter what the current president may think ran a title of, ran a profile of Professor Gilmore entitled, Is Prison Necessary? Ruth Wilson Gilmore May Change Your Mind in April this year. I'm old enough to have seen many good ideas lose out to bad ones on the terrain of politics. But the Gramscian truism of pessim pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will comes to the rescue. I'm hoping we're seeing a sea change in the thinking about the possibilities of abolition and it actually might become politically, forces might be rearranged to make it become politically more mainstream though that comes with its own risks. Okay. Abolition is, and in terms of its long history, was a radical idea. Not in the vernacular sense of radical as extremist or fringe, but rather in the sense of its Latinate roots. Radical as in getting to the root of the problem, to move beyond the symptoms to the cause. I have known Ruth Wilson Gilmoy in a fanboy, fellow traveler kind of way for nearly 20 years now. <laughs> Probably not well enough to call her Ruthie, but I do anyway. <laughs> she is an extraordinary scholar activist, righteous but never pious, terrifyingly intelligent yet remarkably patient, Deadly serious and hilariously funny. And then if my students are here, and you'd better be, I'm allowed to use more adjectives than you are. <laughs> I suspect we are in for something as life-changing as a talk can be. Okay, here's that. Ruth Wilson Gilmore is Professor of Geography in the Doctoral Program in Earth and Environmental <laughs> Sciences and Associate Director of the Center for Place, Culture and Politics at the City University of New York. Golden Gulag won the Laura Romero First Book Award. Uh, from the American Studies Association, and Professor Gilmore was awarded the Angela Davis Award for Public Scholarship in 2012. She works extensively with a variety of community and active, activist organizations 
from mothers reclaiming our children to critical resistance. She makes knowledge that it matters and is useful to a wide variety of people. Um, I love the title of Golden Gulag. It has a kind of guttural, glittering, <laughs> elusive alliteration. It plays with Cold War rhetoric in an interesting way. Because, of course, rates of incarceration in the United States are way, way higher than they ever were in the Soviet Union. Um, and even the, I mean, I, the acknowledgments of Golden Gulag, <laughs> Professor Gilmore says it was a book a long time in coming, but that's because there were decades and decades of political work before that. And in that political work, Professor Gilmore was accompanied by Craig Gilmore, an important prison abolitionist activist in his own right, and I suspect somebody who helped you get organized. <laughs> May we all have such husbands. <laughs> um, and it's great, it's great to have Craig Gilmore with us here as well. Um, so I think that's more than enough from me um, to participate in another subcultural vernacular. Fasten your seatbelts. <laughs> it might be a bumpy ride. Take notes, and here's Ruthie. <laughs> As you might not know, I don't like to be called Ruth. <laughs> so unless one is familiar enough with me to call me Ruthie, Dr. Gilmore will do fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, Neville and Karen Engel and all of the people who work together collaboratively to get me here this evening. Thank you so much, Sissy Farnthold, for being such a model for all of us in the struggles that we wage in our daily lives. Thank you all for coming out and fitting in the room. That's really great. I was worried about that. And um, let's just dive in. I have too much to say for the amount of time that we have. I won't discuss every picture, but I'll have pictures just to keep the room uh, lively. Uh, this talk, meanwhile, Making Abolition Geographies Happen, is in memory of Rosemary Braz. She was a criminal defense lawyer who threw lawyering off because she couldn't defend enough people fast enough to satisfy herself. Somebody who worked in the anti-apartheid movement, uh, worked against sexism, worked against uh, enforced gender conformity, and was one of the co-founders and truly the leading organizational and theoretical light of critical resistance. She passed away um, in 2017 also. I lost 50 years of friends in three months in 2017. Barbara Harlow, in whose memory this is also uh, offered to you tonight, and Rosemary Braz, both of them, presente. Here we go. I'm gonna, oh, I'm gonna read some and I'm gonna talk some so that I can get through 8,000 case studies in <laughs> 45 minutes. All right, everyone was surprised when the United States Supreme Court upheld a federal Ninth Circuit Court ruling that declared California could not build out itself out of the predicament that had made the immense prison system so deadly that at least one person per week, every week for decades, died prematurely because of medical neglect. This is a public system with public prisons and public doctors, it's 100% public. Premature death comes from causes that can be taken care of and are not. The organized abandonment of people locked up by the California Department of Corrections provoked a difficult legal journey through the federal courts. What brought the state's building program to a halt after it had opened a prison per year every year for 23 years? 
The media, both mainstream media and social media, remain fixated on top-down actions like the court order or Sacramento's reluctant response. Sacramento's the uh, capital of California. Hardly anybody wondered about what had changed in California's long thickening carceral geography, much less how those changes had come about in the form of provisional abolition geographies. So in this talk, we're going to explore how organizing from the ground up interrupted California's prison building boom. What are some of the problems organizers puzzled over? And what kinds of tasks did they set themselves? How did, con uh, how did combining legal and political struggle on the one hand and connecting labor, environmental, gender, and municipal effort on the other raise barriers to prison expansion and radiate consciousness and strategy to repurpose common sense about how and where to fight. There is a poetry involved in this, and I don't mean to say somehow we are pretending to be poets. I mean that the kinds of things that Natalie and Duane were talking about earlier have everything to do with leading sometimes with your heart instead of your head to get something done. How did the state government's devolution of some carceral capacity to the counties interact with the spatial challenges organizers took up while proliferating new sites of struggle? Carceral geographies developed deliberately but not inevitably. If the prison fix is a spatial solution to social, economic, and political problems, it is necessarily indicative of places, power, and processes that radiate far beyond any group of buildings surrounded by barbed wire or an electrified fence. Therefore, spatial challenges consist not only in trying to figure out power targets in various jurisdictions, but also in identifying powerfully alternative territorial scopes to use in making power. Profound shifts in the density, control, and purpose of money and other capital, private, public, or a combination of the two, through the spatial organization of capitalism into motion. So we call it globalization, we call it neoliberalism. It's one round of many rounds of capitalism, saving capitalism from capitalism. Extensive and intensive crises compelled all kinds of people to try to achieve stability by applying what they already knew how to do to new problems and by learning new ways to resolve persistent problems. In other, um, in other work, excuse me, can't read my own typing. <laughs> In some of my other work, particularly in Golden Gulag, I have detailed uh, quite vivid urban and rural cases that show the underlying problem of crisis in motion. But here's the most important point for us to consider tonight. Ultimately, abolition is a practical program of change rooted in how people sustain and improve their lives cobbling together insights and strategies from disparate, connected struggles. That's what abolition is. We know we won't bulldoze prisons and jails tomorrow, although we're willing to try. But as long as they continue to be advanced as the solution, all of the inequalities displaced to crime and punishment will persist. In this lecture, we're going to see again how people who organized in dynamically unstable gaps combine to make power by making connections, or what we might call abolitionist popular fronts, through militantly practical pursuit of transitional goals. So there's always one. Let's see if this works. Right on. <laughs> At the outset, the California Prison Moratorium Project, which started in the summer of 1998, wasn't certain where to begin. After many fits and starts, using research done for the first edition of my book, Golden Gulag, California Prison Moratorium Project zeroed in on the South San Joaquin Valley of California. 
They did outreach in the vast region by way of classified ads in weekly newspapers. This is paper newspapers. Uh, that invited people who wanted to stop a prison in their town to call a local number where a voicemail would take their information and promise a human would soon phone them back. The cost for the outreach was low, as befit a tiny organization made up entirely of volunteers who supplemented their modest resources with an annual afternoon bolathon fundraiser. While they didn't know who they'd find, they knew every town had at least one prison opponent, often a small business person, sometimes the chronic malcontent, in other places a journalist, a school teacher, a union organizer, a priest. But there was always one, stranded by the flood of intuitive common sense that insisted local expenditures of hundreds of millions of dollars could not fail to improve modestly educated local people's lives. Big dollar numerators and small population denominators suggested something terrific could happen if people could only figure out how to make some of the flowing cash stick. As I have proven, and others have proven as well in other jurisdictions, failure turned out to be the rule, not the exception. Frustrated opponents called the number in the newspaper. Some were not even from places facing new prisons, but rather towns that had said yes and then lost their night sky or calm roads or saw affordable housing swept away by new developments intended for highly paid guards. Others called to complain about a new culture that disrupted the community. Violence attributed to guards' families, correctly or not as well as the fact that for whatever reasons, guards' families generally didn't settle near where they worked. The calls went, were not many, but they added up, and the organization responded and offered to meet. A quick run down the valley by six organizers over a three-day weekend turned up a number of people who eventually participated in a mini-conference held at Berkeley to discuss how best to stop prisons and form the knowledge backbone of an organizing tool that Prison Moratorium Project produced in a 2003 first draft called How to Stop a Prison in Your Town. It's still available online for free. At the heart of the mini-conference lay a surprising success story. At about this same period, which is to say between 1996 and 2001, the organized labor movement across the United States had been recruiting young people, mainly although not exclusively college students, to immerse themselves in training called Union Summer to become field organizers. The union history of rural California from the Coachella Valley up across the transverse range and through the San Joaquin Valley and up into the woods and mines of the north is a story of stark antagonisms recapitulated across sectors and periods, but neither settled nor abandoned. Young people joined the United Farm Workers by way of Union Summer and used networks that radiated through universities and labor councils to share strategies, connect campaigns, and issue calls for solidarity in struggle. Prison Moratorium Project learned from a prosperous valley farmer and from colleagues of colleagues who worked with the UFW that new prisons were being proposed in the South San Joaquin. The farmer didn't want the prison because the small city, which is what a prison is, it's a city, because the small city would use too much water. The farm workers, unemployed because a freeze had destroyed several crops, didn't want the prison because having made or known others who make the long circular migration through the valley's fields and crops and other new prison towns, they were convinced they would not get jobs in the prison, but more likely would find themselves either locked up or visiting locked up loved ones. While meeting with the farmer, who had fought back several proposed prisons in his county, uh, the organizers from Prison Moratorium learned that the small cohort of anti-prison farmers, they call themselves growers in California, <laughs> anti-prison growers had made the conscious transition from not in my backyard to not in anybody's backyard. Why? Mostly, they were perplexed that year on year, after defeating a prison proposal, a new one would pop up on a county agenda, 
Different host town, same vulnerable water table. One of the farmers, a grandmother, decided in 1999 to learn a new skill and had her college grandson teach her to surf the web. <laughs> she discovered and shared with her group that the eminent Rand Corporation, hardly lefty loony, showed that locking up more and more Californians wasn't really solving problems. In other words, the farmers did not believe either that achieving something, the farmers did not believe either that achieving some carceral goal would end something called crime or that the pipeline of criminalized people existed because crime was out of control. They did not argue, as they might earlier have done, that the prisons should be in the communities the prisoners come from. Rather, the farmers decided that only a barrier to new prisons altogether would compel urban California, which they tended to call Los Angeles, <laughs> to do something else with their money and people. These relatively small but prosperous farmers, um, family farmers, neither embraced nor opposed the welfare state somewhere else, but at the same time as deeply dependent on seasonal labor, they hardly wanted wage competition or alternatives to weaken their labor market control. So this is not like, ah, we found utopia. They spoke approvingly about the de facto porous borders that ensured an adequate supply of migrant farm workers despite whatever immigration laws might be current. So this is the complexity we were dealing with. In the same county, the United Farm Workers, meanwhile, was working to link hungry households with food. Meeting people at distribution centers or going door to door to ensure people realized they were eligible for food and not embarrassed to receive it, the union organizers became aware of members' anxiety concerning the new prison. The organizers put out a, a scattershot call for help. Prison Moratorium got the message a few different ways at once. It bounced through a think tank in Washington, D.C., it relayed between former college roommates, and it surfaced at a dinner of casual acquaintances. Here's the solution, situation, who can help call this person? Prison Moratorium Project called. As it turned out, the public hearing on whether to approve this particular prison was slated for the Monday following the September weekend that Prison Moratorium Project organizers had scheduled to drive around the valley and meet some lonely opponents who had called the voicemail. In back-to-back -back meetings with the farmer and the organizer, and these were separate meetings uh, for good reason, in the corner of a diner, Prison Moratorium Project laid out a strategy that they had derived from their militant research and cut a solid argument against any prison into two or three sentence pieces, each of which would fit the two minute limit imposed on public comment. All of the sentences were translated so that people could testify in the two major but hardly exclusive town languages, Spanish and English. Other languages might well have been Hmong, Mixtec, or Urdu. The farm workers spoke, the farmers spoke. They laced their remarks in ways that demonstrated their mutual dependence in a world they can't much control, as well as their unequal power in commanding the undivided attention of the decision-making body. But everyone said their lines. At the end of the hearing, the council deliberated and voted unanim unanimously against the prison. I never want to hear about a prison in this town again, one of the council persons said in exhausted disgust. Sharing their experiences later in the small statewide mini conference, um, uh, two of the people who testified, a UFW regular and her teenage daughter, explained how the region's fraught geography gave them no alternative but to speak up for the record and encourage others to do the same. The, their need as migrant workers to be in fairly constant motion across space meant that every household had stories of people stopped, detained, threatened by local and county police who, despite not being federales, wield immigration enforcement along with the many other tools of organized violence. Meanwhile, 
The organized abandonment of transportation and other infrastructure, always promised to get better with the proposed prison, made both moving about and staying at home difficult. The daughter explained how her high school education seemed designed to channel her ambitions to individualistic ends, in part by thwarting her effort to organize a student United Farm Workers chapter at her school. They, she and her mother, talked about how they had to be creative in order to mitigate the difficulties they and their families and neighbors endure in the region, but also how standing up to the council in a time of hunger shifted some people's consciousness of the union even more than the fact that the union had been feeding hungry people. The observations bring to mind, of course, the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense motto, survival pending revolution, or the words U.S. communist organizers spoke to the people whose doors they knocked on after work uh, during the Great Depression. Hello. My name is Ruthie Gilmore, I'm from the Communist Party, and I'm here to help you solve your problems. The practical work and attendant shift in consciousness was enabled by, although not fully realized as, the food program. The mode of organizing, if not the outcome, was reproducible, and prison moratorium organizers traveled around California, sometimes one at a time, sometimes in twos and threes, to work with communities facing similar challenges. In most cases, some kind of organizational infrastructure already existed, even if the person who put out the alarm, a photographer, a gramp grumpy grandmother, was not part of a group. While small groups found ways to connect with other organizations over common concerns. But more, the mobile organizing unit put communities in touch with one another, and before cheap social media made intense collaboration at least seem easier, People used telephones and fax machines, automobiles, and email to make common cause with strangers across counties and regions, and eventually in other states as well, and more and more internationally. The scale and scope of convergences in this small story offer a glimpse into the dynamics of change on the ground of the Golden State's prison terrain. This section's called 70 million or more. A handful of people from critical resistance and California prison moratorium projects set out to stop a different new prison from the one I was just talking about. The proposed new facility had been a thank you gift to the California Correctional Peace Officers Association, that is the prison guards um, uh, union, 100% public, 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 from newly elected, then newly elected Governor Gray Davis, this is also the late 1990s, in appreciation of the guard's million dollar do donation to his campaign. Prior research uh, had already revealed that the state's next prison would be put in Delano alongside another new era mega prison. The multi-generation organizers turned their accumulated experience across a wide variety of long duration campaigns, local, national, and international, to the task of getting advice and contacts from and about already organized people who might be summoned to the Stop Delano II campaign. They brought strategies and histories from anti-apartheid, black power, agricultural boycott, university anti-racism and anti-sexism campaigns to bear on how they approached people in faith communities, worker centers, and hiring halls, social justice and environmental groups, schools and colleges, municipalities and development agencies, and of course unions. The Union Summers, which I discussed briefly, at the tail end of the 20th century, brought new tacticians into a variety of large-scale organizations that focused on a broad range of people who were vulnerable for any combination of these attributes. Low wage, high value added, contingent, women or feminized labor, non-citizens, people with records, public servants across specialties, isolated workers of various skill levels, whether truck drivers or home health care providers. Long-term or novice rank-and-file organizers set their sights on workers for whom buttressing their side of power relations on the job would be worth the risk, always a risk. 
So outreach involved both identifying and persuading possible members, planning campaigns, winning elections, and getting to the bargaining table. The effort to grow unions ran against a strong trend, uh, ran against many strong trends in opposite directions, worker outsourcing, collective bargaining givebacks, narrowing interpretation of rights, eligibility, and discouraging decisions by external governing bodies, especially the National Labor Review Board. Unions also competed with each other to grow membership, and some justified criticism argued that raw numbers seem to mean more than securing reliable wages, benefits, and job security. Within these labor institutions, members fought each other over what the union should do, how, and to what end. For many years, members of the California State Employees Association, the half million member California Service Employee International Union's biggest local, struggled to reinvigorate their union's democratic principles and practices. Some of the opposition vying for, uh, vying for leadership included non-guard prison workers, non-guard prison workers, especially <coughs> teachers, who had provided education inside the walls their entire careers. And Dwayne Betts spoke briefly about education inside the walls being in various ways snatched out from inside, um, though never completely uh, erasable. Uh, blah, 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 blah. See, that's what happens when you make a sides. <laughs> They had firsthand experience of the system's rapid growth and witnessed the guards union consolidate its power. As the system acquired square footage and prisoners, educational opportunities withered. The teachers and their comrades in the struggle knew firsthand the role education played in enabling people to go home and stay home from prison, at least under earlier regimes of criminalization. Indeed, they knew that their students were among the people who, at most recent count, add up to about half of the US workforce. 70 million people who, because of arrest or conviction <coughs> records, have impediments that keep them from many jobs available to modestly educated people in the free world. That's half of the labor force of the United States. And when the New York Times fact checker called the US Department of Labor, to try to blow up this number before they published it in the New York Times Sunday Magazine. The guy at the other end of the phone said, mm, Gilmore's a little low. The number's probably 100 million. So this is a conservative estimate. OK. Uh, despite good arguments, the prison teachers faced a set of structural impediments that couldn't be solved by petitioning management or even teaching bigger classes. Resources drained away from elementary and secondary level classrooms, and many of the instructional paces, uh, spaces filled, uh, were filled with bunks, while during the same period, as I mentioned, federal money that had been available was taken away by President Clinton. Um, the guards union depended for its size and dues, and their uh, thereby its political donation clout, on maintaining a steady flow of people into and therefore growth of the system. Um, best practices, guidelines, and contract agreements specified the ratio of custody staff to prisoners with higher security prisoners producing the highest number of union jobs. Now this is the same prison system where people are dying once a week every week for decades, right? So it's not like the resources weren't put into the prison in the form of salaries, high salaries. As somebody said, pardon if you're a vegetarian or a vegan, but you know, guards can eat steak every night if they want to. Um, in addition, the fate of people released on parole lay in the hands of members of the guards union, as parole officers were police rather than the social workers county probation officers had been trained to be. And this is not a crime for probation. They're different, however. Famously, people on parole in California were twice as likely as people on parole anywhere else in the United States to be sent back to prison on technical violations, 70% as compared with one in three, uh, for an additional six to 12 months. 
Less than a year might seem short relative to growing sentences, but as, been, as has been vividly reported in jail studies, even a brief custody period, I'm talking about a night, a brief custody period uh, completely upends people's lives, costing them shelter, employment, court expenses, mental well-being, and household and community relationships. Mm -hmm. At the same time, Prison short timers, not unlike lifers at the other end, rarely had the chance to participate meaningfully, if at all, in the remaining classroom opportunities. So you have this various kinds of apartheid at work. At the outset, the Stop Delano II organizers had tried to incite enthusiastic response to outreach from non-prison state employees whose agencies and individual jobs were facing the kind of squeeze the prison teachers endured. Opposing program cuts and layoffs were part of the ongoing fight to save the welfare state from organized abandonment. But it didn't appear that those whose jobs depended on the forces of organized violence, such as the prisons, would be particularly receptive, given the substantial year-over-year -year increments their wedge of the budget enjoyed. Ah, but competition within institutions, as we who labor in higher education know, is a real thing with real consequences. Com complementing efforts to build the popular front, anti-Delano II organizers also tried to starve the project of legislative votes it needed for funding and lugged stacks of reports issued by reputable think tanks from office to office showing that Californians didn't want the prison, they didn't think they needed the prison, and they didn't want to spend the money on the prison. The goal was politically to link these sentiments with the needs of state social welfare employees and their clients in order to raise questions and spark debates about the proper use of the social wage. That said, it came as a surprise when the California State Employees Association legislative director agreed to a meeting and five organizers drove to Sacramento to see what it would entail. So despite long preparation for a day that was not certain ever to come, the organizers were stunned to find that the com combination of persistent and targeted outreach with the noisier public face of the campaign meant the meeting with several dozen strangers was far beyond entry level, why is this prison not a good idea? Indeed, most of the participants in the meeting who spoke were shop stewards and the general agreement was that both the Delano II prison should not go forward because the guards get everything, and a proposed expansion to San Quentin, the state's oldest prison in sight of death row, should not happen either. What organizers had expected was a repeat of experiences they'd had in Sacramento on numerous occasions, which is to say, and all of you who are abolitionists have had this experience, that political actors, whether individually or in blocks, will cozy up to abolitionists in order to send a message to their opponents about the extreme steps they might take if certain compromises fail to materialize. So you get caught in that dance a lot, but we still have to dance it. We still have to dance it. We have to dance it smart. The organizers had been in the thick of many such events and generally toughed it out because there were opportunities to shape arguments right, to shape arguments in such a way that taken for granted categories such as prison growth is a response to crime could be weakened if not demolished in mainstream debates. So we're working on all these fronts at once. For the members who agreed to fight the CCP, the guards union by fighting the new prison, the issue came down to renovating the union's larger purpose. The discussion in the room and uh, the knowledge prison workers and others brought into the room compelled the analysis to develop beyond the Department of Corrections and focus instead on the opportunities for the union and its members, wherever they might be at the moment, in the free world. Put another way, while the guard union members absolutely required prisons or jails or people on parole, the same was as absolutely not true for all the other union members. It was absolutely not true. By contrast, because many of the jobs potential and actual members perform depend on public spending, the budgetary issue arose not as a smarter path to austerity, um, but rather a demand for the social wage to be committed to life-affirming and enhancing activities. 
But whether public or private, the union membership at half a million represented people laboring across work sites from, as I said earlier, isolated home health care or drivers to hospitals, offices, food service, educational institutions, and beyond. At the end of the day, a member's specific trade determined but did not define how to understand the moment. A locksmith is a locksmith. A janitor is a janitor, a secretary is a secretary, a teacher is a teacher. Okay. So now I'm going to be more talky because I have to zoom through a lot. All the young black people in their urban high school auditorium listened for a few minutes and then they slouched in their seats and dropped their heads. Why? Because activists had come into a room where school teachers had selected students who were more likely black or of color and least likely to be going to college. And this was in Berkeley High School, one of the most segregated places on the planet within the school within the school, within the building, to hear from people who were organizing the very first critical resistance conference. We foolishly thought that by outlining the, groom, the gloom and doom that we had all come to learn, some of which was made up in the, at the outset, for example, the mythical figure that one in three black men will go to prison, or the more mythical figure that there are more black men in prison than in college. It's both untrue. But we all repeated it because we thought it was true. Did one thing and one thing only. We depressed all the young people we'd gone there to incite to action. And we lived up to their nightmare of teachers, strident, old, scoldy, and bleak. <laughs> so we had to learn something new. And what we decided to learn was how to think about curriculum differently. Many, many people in many walks of life have done this sort of work, most notably and famously um, uh, Paulo Freire in Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And even Paulo Freire got his inspiration from studying the education program of the PAIGC, which was the revolutionary party that fought for and eventually won the liberation of Guinea-Bissau uh, in the long revolution between 1961 and 1974. So the name you most ordinarily associate with the PAIGC is Amilcar Cabral. There were many, many people involved in developing the education program. And in thinking about curriculum, we got to thinking about what happened in an earlier round of revolutionary activity in the United States of America. So the two people on the left of this image are um, John Huggins above and Bunchy Carter below. They were members of the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense in the Los Angeles chapter. And they were quite famously killed in a shootout in Campbell Hall on January the 19th, 1969. So it was 50 and a half years ago, almost to the day. What were they doing in Campbell Hall on a Saturday? They were arguing, not with their guns, that was an ambush. They were arguing in a meeting that was called quite openly over what the curriculum for the Black Studies Department that was newly developing at UCLA should be. And they were arguing for a curriculum that took up questions of racism capitalism, colonialism, and imperialism. John had served in the US Navy, in Tonkin, in Vietnam, and indeed had been organized into the Black Panther Party when he demobilized at Oakland, or San Francisco, anyway, in the San Francisco Bay when he got out of the service after his time. Bunchy Carter had done time in another total institution in the California Department of Corrections. And the Black Panthers organized 
and recruited people from both total institutions, thinking appropriately that in some cases, people's consciousness had been cracked open and something new could develop. So thinking about curriculum uh, brought some people to, into uh, conversation and eventually organizing with a number of school teachers, first in some of the public in schools in the uh, San Francisco Bay Area, and then throughout California, and eventually throughout the United States. And they started an organization called Education Not Incarceration. Inspired by the walkouts and the other radical activities of the late 1960s and early 1970s and concerned in the late 1990s and early 2000s about the shrinkage of the social wage and the displacement of resources from, one, uh, uh, from programs that would prote uh, produce opportunity and protect from calamity into punishment, 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 the teachers thought to build a movement within their schools, including students and parents, and to agitate for curricular changes that would, as it were, conscientize, which is to say open up the curriculum, not to the facts of imprisonment, but rather to the facts of the world that made punishment seem like a natural, normal, inevitable, and necessary thing. The education, not incarceration, eventually, in its spread, involved people who worked throughout the state of California. That's the famous Dolores Huerta, one of the co-founders of United Farm, Farm Workers with uh, Cesar Chavez. And um, extended, as I said, throughout the state of California and became the seed of a project that eventually the National Education Association took up um, in its annual conference that was held in New Orleans, Louisiana, uh, I forget which year, in the early 2000s, in which um, fortunately for abolitionists, Angela Davis was the keynote speaker. In the con context of Davis being the keynote speaker, a small cadre of people in the NEA agreed to take up the idea of developing an education, not incarceration curriculum in order to make that curriculum available to teachers to use in their locals uh, throughout the United States. So this was another way that abolition geography were um, uh, abolition geographies developed in this period when that lawsuit that I told you about at the very beginning of my lecture was winding its way through the courts. As I said, children were involved in this, not simply as objects of instruction, but also in uh, ways that involved them developing their analysis of what was happening, shifting their consciousness of why things were the way they are, and then going off to speak to um, all different kinds of people, including legislators, uh, to demand uh, adequate funding for schools and to demand the end of criminalization. And indeed, uh, quite famously, when several thousand kids went to Sacra Sacramento from all over the state of California, uh, several legislators, uh, staff people called the police when the kids walked in the room, when the school children walked in the room. So the kids had firsthand already some understanding and having had the police call on them when they walked into a legislator's office, I think radicalized them in ways that many other experiences might not have. Children, indeed, um, form in many ways one of the most hotly contested um, uh, uh, categories of concern across the entire range of penal reform, human rights, and abolition. We all are uh, painfully aware of what is going on with children here at the border, uh, along the US-Mexico border. Uh, my colleague from the Rothko Center talked about the fact that 
children in Texas are, are, are tried as adults. Uh, we also know that in many ways, a lot of reform holds up children as the relatively innocent and tries to demand for children what children should have, but demand it using language and logic that suggests that if the children get it, they should be the only ones to get it, and everybody else should be forever forbidden from having those benefits and um, opportunities. That is the kind of reformist reform to which certain kinds of insistence on relative innocence, the relative innocence of children, the relative innocence of people in prisons for women, the relative innocence of people who cross the border or who use drugs, completely um, reinforces the hard, hard, hard wall between those categories of people which no individual can guarantee that he or she or they will inhabit very long, and all of the categories of people for whom organized violence and the punished re regime are, to repeat myself, a natural, necessary, and inevitable end. So in thinking about children and thinking about the well-being, of all kinds of people in vulnerable situations, um, organizers returned to California's Central Valley, in part, again, because that's where the state had been building, prison after prison after prison after prison after prison. And in going back, uh, this time, what the organizers did was to take seriously in uh, uh, the concerns that all kinds of community organizers had raised concerning uh, environmental uh, harms and who had organized themselves under the rubric of environmental justice. Now, some of you who might have read uh, the profile that Rachel Kushner wrote um, about me in the New York Times know that one of the uh, experiences I had in the Central Valley at an environmental justice meeting was being confronted by a number of kids between the ages of, I'd say, about 10 and 17, maybe a little bit younger to not much older though, who were absolutely outraged when somebody told them that I was an abolitionist. They just could not deal with this. So they summoned me to tell me that I was wrong. So he asked me some questions and I, spoke, and they, they were dressed to flirt, you know? So they weren't there for me, they were there for each other. And <laughs> they tolerated me with a lot of side eye, and then they dismissed me. They dismissed me, but they asked a lot of good questions, like what about people who do this? What about people who kill people? What about people who suffer harms? What about them, what about them? And we talked about the various ways that that accountability for harms does not necessarily mean you lose your entire life if you harm somebody. You, you lose your entire life either with a death penalty or life without, or many, 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 many years if you hurt somebody. We talked about that, but again, they dismissed me. The symbolic resonance, resonance of the new Delano prison site influenced organizers thinking about how to make a movement to stop it. So think about this, the Delano, uh, excuse me, the United Farm Workers uh, Central Office uh, had been uh, for years in Delano and the name of their place was called 40 Acres. 40 Acres. Um, the new prison was gonna be built literally across the street from 40 Acres. I mean, right across the street. Now, the United Farm Workers had named their place, their central place, their meeting place, 40 acres, uh, in, in a way to raise up the stretch across time and space of the struggle that farm workers engaged in in the Central Valley, its connection to earlier agricultural workers' struggles and ongoing agricultural workers' struggles across the United States to inspire people to think about the never realized promise 
of 40 acres to be granted to freed people in the U.S. South after the Civil War under, uh, during Reconstruction, and to suggest as well the underlying, the too or ordinarily unspoken fact that the land in Georgia, the 40 acres, or in California, the 40 acres, was land that had been taken by force or disrespected treaty from Native Americans, right? So all of this is in play with this simple name, 40 Acres. At 40 Acres, a group of people came together to form something called the Central California Environmental Justice Network. And this was a group of, again, very tiny but connected uh, community organizers who were fighting against all kinds of environmental harms, pesticides, diesel exhaust, uh, arsenic in water, you name it. They were fighting against it. <clears throat> Organizers who were trying to stop the California, this new prison read the required environmental impact statement, the whole thing, not just the beginning, all of the pages, to see what it had to say about what that city, which a prison is, again, would, what kind of impacts that city would have in the South San Joaquin Valley. Now, most environmental impact statements, and forgive me if you've written a good one and you're in this room, <laughs> most of them are really bad. They tend to be shabby pieces of geospatial analysis cut and pasted by people with geography and planning degrees. I have a geography degree and I studied a lot of planning. This is how I can tell, right? <laughs> Who are fulfilling contractually the letter of the law and no spirit of the law. So, in reading the environmental, uh, environmental impact state uh, report, uh, it became clear that it would be possible to do outreach to environmental justice activists, and so we did. And it took 20 minutes of presentation to persuade a room full of people, as numerous as this room, to agree that prisons were part of the environmental harms that communities faced. 20 minutes. Two people talking, two and a half, well, two minutes in English, two and a, uh, three minutes in Spanish. Spanish takes more words. That was five. And then we showed, it is, it's true. And then we showed a 15 minute film that was bilingual, English and Spanish. 20 minutes, people said, we get it. Where do, how, how are we gonna work together? And so we did. So out of that came a multi-pronged uh, effort to work with organizations for biological diversity, people like these people you see here, uh, working on environmental uh, justice issues, people who are working against uh, the proliferation of environmental harms, and to build a regional response that would be actually a transnational response. And these three women who you've been admiring for the last few minutes um, were from Baja California as well as um, Alta California. Um, working together to try to figure out a regional response to environmental harms. And the person who had come from Baja was really interested to learn about the prison because certain kinds of um, systems of social control and ideas and funding to go with it travel the very same routes that um, uh, money capital travels and that US military travels and other unequal forces travel. So at the end of the encounter that I had with the children at the conference where we listened to each other very carefully, the kids came out and presented their best understanding of what environmental harms most concerned them. And they had three Ps, pollution, prisons, and police. Trying to think internationally is what a whole lot of abolitionists 
have been engaged in for quite some time, and some of my comrades are here from around the world, and I look forward to everybody meeting everybody and talking with, with one another, because obviously, although the specific conditions in the United Kingdom, in South Africa, in Brazil, and in other places require knowledge and resources and understanding from the ground up there. There are also ways that our movements can and must stretch and indeed resonate with the kinds of internationalism that characterizes the better angels of human rights activism. Um, Michael Zinzen, who was also a member of the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense, himself went from working against police violence, which is what he did in the first part of his career all the time, to working against um, environmental harms and particularly pesticides, especially the pesticides used to combat urban problems such as roaches and mice that infest many uh, neglected um, uh, residential areas. Uh, where poor people live. Michael Zinson himself had an expansive uh, impact and influence on how many people came to think of themselves politically in the world, not only in greater Southern California, but also throughout Mexico and in Brazil. And I believe there's a center name for him in Salvador de Bahia. Zinson's work constantly circulated between and among issues and considerations, and also always uh, insisted that we come back to how the local is changing over time in relation to the changes at various other scales throughout the areas in which we struggle. So in building abolition geographies in California, uh, it became necessary to figure out how to mount campaigns at a more local level, so not, no longer at the Sacramento level, but in the, at the level of the city and the county, uh, in order to get people to raise their awareness of and struggle against the rescaling of organized violence and policing and punishment through a relatively new but now rapidly growing uh, pattern of increasing jails while decreasing prisons. So jail prison distinction. In the late, uh, in the early 2000s, uh, when uh, probably the most famous cop on the planet, William Bratton, was uh, head of the Los Angeles Police Department. The city and county of Los Angeles tried to raise taxes in order to hire a thousand new cops and build a new jail. And people fought and 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 actually defeated it. It took a long time. And this is an image of uh, a little dramatic thing we did at the beginning of an event where we asked, we gave everybody uh, post-its, which were the equivalent of the amount of money that these taxes would have raised. And we said to each person, here, you go spend a half a billion dollars. What would you spend it on? And they spent it. And this was just the backdrop for our, our continuing discussion. Organizing with people we knew became, uh, we, in order to do this organizing, one of the things we had to do was organizing with people we knew would become our next opponents, right? But since we did that, it meant that we could not agree to any kind of platform, rule, campaign, or law that we would have to undo if we won, right? This is, this is the difference between non-reformist reform and reformist reform. So abolitionists, therefore, rather than being starry-eyed perfectionists, settle into figuring out what it means to win and then to plan for it. 
And again, I'm going to say it, planning to win means to ask what happens the next morning and the next morning and the next morning. So if I have time, oh, we're running out of time. I have another story. Where are we with time? We have plenty? We have plenty? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I hear we have plenty. Okay. All right, so the last bit is called inside out. All right, we good? All right, this is called inside out, and it's two stories. Two stories in one, so I kind of lied. Wait, no, this one, okay. You don't have to read the details. It's just an artifact. All right, so um, in the same period, I am telling you about, that's why this thing is called Meanwhile. All these things I'm telling you, they all happen meanwhile. Meanwhile, 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 meanwhile. So in this, this layered story, uh, overlapping and interlocking struggles, uh, the Department of Corrections in California changed its name to the Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. And at the same time that it changed its name, it established a Gender Responsive Corrections Commission, or committee. And this seemed like a great victory as it was uh, going to allow people uh, in prisons for women to have advocates in the free world, including some people who had been locked up in the prisons for women, to say something about gender corrections. At the outset, the call, a call was sent out to the wardens of the prisons for women saying, Identify 4,000 people who shouldn't be in prison. And we thought, we won. 4,000 fewer is 4,000 fewer. And there were no strings attached about, well, if you identify 4,000, the 4,000 and first person has got to stay there forever. That was not attached. So this was the, the idea, and everybody was very excited, and there were meetings, 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 and then somebody got wind of it and said, wait a second. Instead of doing that, why don't we do this? Why don't we build some new gender responsive prisons? Prisons that are smaller and more family friendly and people who are in prisons for women can be there with their children if they have children and uh, otherwise have a, a more pleasant prison experience. This is more or less what's happening now in New York City. Um, uh, that people are protesting at the Ford Foundation today about. Uh, so gender responsive corrections proposed these female responsive community correction uh, centers. People organized against these prisons in the free world. You already can imagine this from all the stories I've already told you. They also organized inside. 3,000 500 people in prisons for women in California, at great risk to themselves, signed petitions that they managed to smuggle around the pr prisons that were headed not in our name. And they s refused to accept that as horrible as the prisons are that they were staying in, that the state of California would ever build a new prison that would be a better experience because it was going to be a prison. A prison. That was the problem. That was the problem. So the people in the prisons for women, I keep saying it that way so you understand about gender. People in the prisons for women signed these petitions, smuggled them out, and then people in the free world glued them all together into a long, long strip and blew them up to about this big and laminated them and did a very dramatic drop at the state legislature when the state legislature was debating whether or not to fund these new prisons. Fought and fought and fought and fought. We stopped them, stopped them, stopped them, stopped them over and over again. I will tell you that many people who were well-meaning people were so astonished and outraged that we would be against a better building for the people in prison for women, that we were accused of being misogynist and racist. 
And we laughed, but it was serious. It was serious as a heart attack. That this, had, this was the only way that people could understand opposition to prison. Just as in New York now, opposition to four new boutique prisons instead of the horror of Rikers Island, the argument is people are raped in Rikers Island, they won't be raped in the new buildings. Why would a building change relationships? How could it be that all of us have had enough experience, exposure to Marx that we know better, we should, than to confuse relations between things Right? As relations between people, excuse me, relations between people as relations between things. But this is how it works. This is how it works exactly. So, the state of California has not managed to build one of these new prisons, but the county, under the uh, logic of devolution, if you proliferate the sites of struggle, it'll be harder for people to fight. <laughs> What happened in New York, it's what's happened in California. The county decided to try to build a new prison uh, jail for women and a new jail for men. Last spring, organizers in Los Angeles defeated the new jail for women. So 15 years after this, 15 years almost to the minute after this, Organizers in Los Angeles defeated another one. And three weeks ago, organizers defeated a new jail for men. Again, 15 years after this one. 15 years. It's a long, long struggle. A really long struggle. So here's the last, last story. In the 1970s, the California Department of Corrections decided to reorganize the social and spatial world of people in prison in response to both reformist and radical mobilization. Evidence shows that the Department of Corrections experimented with a variety of disruptive schemes to end the solidarity that had arisen among its diverse, although then mostly white, population in the prisons for men. Cooperation, forged in study groups and other consciousness-raising activities, had resulted in both significant victories in federal courts over conditions of confinement and deadly retaliation against guards who had been killing prisoners with impunity. In spite of 20 years of Washington, D.C. rulemaking forbidding, among other things, segregation, failure to ad advise of rights, lack of due process, and extrajudicial punishment, the Department of Corrections decided to segregate prisoners into racial, ethnic, and regional groups, label them gangs, and to restrict um, ending the punishment, oh, excuse me, to remand them to indefinite solitary confinement, and to restrict ending the punishment to three actions, snitch, parole, or die. To reify the system as the built environment, the Department of Corrections created two prisons for men and one for women with high-tech security housing units, which is to say a prison within a prison. The history of the security housing units has yet to be fully told, but I have a student working on it now. It's got a great archive, has yet fully to be told. It is indisputable, however, that they induce mental and physical illness, which can lead to suicide or other forms of premature, which is to say preventable death, which is where we started this evening's discussion. Indeed, the United Nations defines solitary confinement in excess of 14 days as torture. And there are people who have been in the security housing unit at Pelican Bay since December the 10th, 1989, the day it opened. The people locked in Pelican Bay State Prison, SHU, so, uh, again, some from the day it opened, might or might not have done what they were convicted of in court. Their innocence doesn't matter. For many years, lawyers and others have worked with people in the SHU trying to d discover the way out, not picking and choosing whom to aid, but interviewing any willing subject about conditions of confinement and struggling to devise a general plan. Workshops, workbooks, testimony, you name it. All, people have done all of this stuff. And indeed, uh, Mike Wallace showed up to do a 60-minute segment uh, at some hearings in Sacramento, and his producer, 
confronted some of us in an elevator and said, tell us why we should care. And we said, well, don't you care about justice? She said, of course I care about justice, but tell me why anyone watching television should care about these people. The department absolves itself of breaking laws and violating court decrees by insisting the gangs that fostered run the prisons and the streets. Now, after almost 40 years of people churning through the expanded department, it's impossible that there's no stretch and resonance across the prison walls. Shoe placement mixes people from ascriptive, what the CDC says, and assertive, what people say about themselves, free world social geographies in order to minimize the possibility of solidarity among people who, the circular logic goes, are by our enemies or they wouldn't be in the shoe. And that's the logic. They can't see or touch each other, but across the din of television sets and the machine noise of prisons, they can talk, debate, and discuss. And while race is not the shoe's only organizing factor, race is the summary term ordinary people inside and out use to name the divisions. For many years, some of the most active shoe residents debated racism versus racialism, first embracing and then challenging a variety of supremacies, while for years continuing to accept the structure of feeling that keeps race constant as a naturally endowed or culturally prefer preferable category. People make abolition geographies from what they have. Changing awareness can radically revise understanding of what can be done with available materials. It's clear that the Security Housing Unit, in calculated opposition to 1970s Soledad or San Quentin or Attica, thins social resources to the breaking point. But what breaks? In many cases, the person's locked up. But consciousness can break into a different dimension, shedding common sense understandings of being and solidarity, identity and change. A negation of violence through violence is possible, which returns us to the territory of selves um, that I didn't invoke because I skipped that part. Even in a total institution, sovereignty is contradictory as resistance to torture demonstrates. The regime, the prison <laughs> regime, its intellectual authors and social agents, its buildings and rules, tortures captives one by one. They can turn on the regime through shifting the object of torture into the subject of history by way of hunger strikes. Participating individuals turn the violence of torture against itself, not by making it not violent, but rather by intentionally repurposing vulnerability to premature death as a totality to be reckoned with, held together by skin. The first strike, hunger strike, that the prisoners engaged in, whose organizers represented all of the alleged prison gangs, sent its demands upward to the CDC, asking for modest improvements for all shoe dwellers' experience and fate, better food, improved vis visitation, and some way to contest their sentences to the prison within a prison based in evidence rather than system growth. People in many non-shoe prisons joined the strike in solidarity and one died. The department offered to negotiate, the strike ended, nothing changed. And let me say as an aside, that for people to join the hunger strike inside, remember we were talking earlier, Dwayne Betts was telling us about making wine in prison is criminalized, but everybody can drink on the outside if they're of age, okay? Similarly, refusing to eat inside in prison was criminalized. And so people who joined the hunger strike got um, tickets in California, they're called 602s. They all got tickets, which meant they were losing good time. And there were people in, even in the shoe, who if they knew they were gonna parole, were clinging really closely to that good time. And many of them gave it up to join the strike and got the 602 for other purposes. Okay. A second strike erupted, well covered both by the ever active in prison grapevine and the organizing collective's free world support infrastructure. 
in the context of the Supreme Court decision concerning medical neglect, and at the time, this was 2011, uprisings in many parts of the planet, North Africa, West Asia, South Africa, the streets of the United States, the demands took a new direction against the partitions that, especially in the contemporary era, normalize devolved imaginations and shrunken affinities when expansive seems absolutely necessary. The collective sent its demands out horizontally, as it were, to their constituent communities inside and outside, calling for an end to the hostility among the races. Now, although some people interpret the call as black-brown solidarity, because race seems to mean people who are not white, the collective's documents are radical and all-encompassing. And you can see all this stuff online. The call has a history as old as modernity, however anachronistic uh, contemporary labels might be. The racial and racial capitalism, this is my last paragraph, <laughs> the racial and racial capitalism isn't epiphenomenal, nor did it originate in color or intercontinental conflict, but rather always in group differentiation, differentiated vulnerability to premature death. Capitalism requires inequality and racism enshrines it. The Pelican Bay State Prison Collective, hidden from each other, experiencing at once the torture of isolation and the extraction of time from their lives, refigured their world, however tentatively, into an abolition geography by finding an infrastructure of feeling on which they could work their experience and understanding of possibility through renovating their own consciousness. The fiction of race projects a peculiar animation of the human body, and people take to the streets in opposition to its real and deadly effects. And in the end, as the relations of racial capitalism take it out of people's hides, the contradiction of skin becomes clearer. Our largest organ, vulnerable to all ambient toxins, Skin, in the end, is all we have to hold us together, no matter how much it seems to keep us apart. Thank you. Okay, we've got a couple of minutes. Let's say 10 minutes for questions. That was really wonderful. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, we reserve the opening questions for local activists. So is Annette Price, um, whenever, whenever you've, you've got first shot at the microphone if you want. Uh, Rhiannon, her mom, are you here? I didn't see you, maybe. You've also got, so, Annette, if you have a question, you could go. Well, can Here's you send the mic there, please? Thank you. Thank you so very much. I appreciate you being here. So in, in today's society, um, many of the uh, uh, organizers are faced with a huge challenge in changing the culture in the way that um, society seems is um, progressive. So what would you offer to young organizers that are dealing um, with a progressive um, county and how to rearrange and rethink and reshape their thinking? That's a great question. What if, why don't we get all the questions so everybody can have, hear voices other than mine and then I'll do my best to answer them. How's that? That sounds great. Deborah's on the podium, so can you let Ruthie do the podium? Hey, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you, call, you call the question. We can just share. Okay, we can tell. Oh, share. <laughs> so get, let's get three or let's get questions. Put your hand up. The man with the mic. Thank you so much, Ruthie. Um, 
It's a question about why at this point in the history of abolition, well, I've heard you speak before, and often when you speak, you go for the big ideas of abolition, and it, this talk that you've given us takes us back to an archive of organizing, and you insist on, on having us hear the hard slog of the organizing. And I have a sense that you are bringing that archive to us because of a particular historical junction around abolition, particularly as it, as it mainstreams, as it comes into debates with decarceration, with human rights. So can you, exp can you tell us, can you let us in on why you chose this strategy tonight? Hi, uh, can I sit down or have to stand up? <laughs> I want to thank you very much for coming. Um, I want to just ask you a quick question. You mentioned something about the not in our name. About what? Uh, not in our name about what was going on in California, about the people who were incarcerated. As someone who spent 27 years in TDCJ myself, mm -hmm. and some of them in Ed SEG, and then has come out and has become an activist and organizer right here, and, an, and a committed abolitionist, um, uh, I've sometimes accused by individuals when I'm down at the Capitol and I'm pushing legislation that'll address certain conditions that I'm perpetuating the system. Um, and I don't think I am. I think that I think there's a difference being in the system and knowing what my comrades are still going through. That I owe it to them to make it as as the the environment as humane and di and dignified as I can. To totally ignore the system, I think wishing that the walls are going to fall down tomorrow or whatever, right? is not necessarily what they're advocating, but that's what a lot of them allude to. So what, I, what I'd like you to kind of address the, that tension because we're having some difficult times here in Texas and in other communities, I'm sure, right? Especially with the campaign that I think you alluded to in New York, the Close Riders campaign, where they want to close down Rikers and maybe open up smaller or whatever in neighborhoods, right? And, and we tend to think that if some of those efforts are accompanied by some meaningful uh, look, uh, look back at sentencing that perhaps has been you know, put out by the model penal code, some other stuff, that perhaps you can do things better. It's not necessarily, yeah, a prison is a prison is a prison as long as you're denied freedom. But would you address that tension for me? Because sure. I'd appreciate that. Sure. Um, so I, did, I guess my question is this, and I, I do appreciate the focus one, I appreciate the story about the conference and the New York Times article, because I think, although it was an excellent article, I feel like uh, Kushner didn't capture the student's question, nor any kind of growth that the students had from them asking you that question to their final presentation, and I thought you captured that better here, because I just wasn't even aware of that from reading that profile, which otherwise I thought was excellent. But my question is about, um, I appreciated the sort of local focus here, but I wonder how do you think about um, the sort of broader perspective, thinking about the ways in which presidential candidates like, or presidents like Clinton was able to go from the top down and influence state policy from creating funding for prisons or creating funding to build prisons if they got rid of parole and things of that nature. I wonder how you um, think about abolition in the context of trying to get the top to put pressure down on the states to reduce their prison populations. Okay, I think, I think that's it. Because I got, I got an hour worth of answer here. <laughs> if you have to leave, leave quietly. Please don't, don't slam the door. All right, all, all really great questions. Um, culture and progressives. My, the advice I give to people of all ages who are new to this work, and it might be especially to young people, um, is to be uh, analytically wary and also trust their guts when it comes to what it is they're fighting for and fighting against and what people mean when they say progressive. I don't call myself a progressive for reasons of being a nerd. <laughs> capital P progressivism was this, this totally capitalist program 
that emerged in the context of the long depression of the late 19th and into the beginning of the 20th century that kind of only wound up with the First World, World War, the First Imperialist War. And progressivism developed hand in hand with, not in spite of, or as in opposition to Jim Crow and apartheid. And uh, more specialized prisons, right? So that's progressivism to me. So I'm not a progressive, so I just want to say that. Um, and, and perhaps if people spend some time uh, listening to, watching, reading, thinking about, meeting with, talking with people about what the various um, dreams of liberation are, it might be very helpful. I also want to say as an aside, I have been a broken record within the ranks of critical resistance. I've been there from the first day. Um, and within the ranks, I think critical resistance should have more conferences. Not because conferences produce revolution, but because conferences enable people who have lots of good ideas and experience and knowledge and puzzles to get together and teach and learn from each other and to get some big ideas at the same time. Right? All of that happens at conferences and it doesn't happen in any other kind of setting. Strangely enough, people don't have time to read as much as some of the people who write can write. I'm not one of those people, I write very slowly. People don't have time to watch everything that's available on YouTube and all these other ways. So, but when people make the time intentionally to come together in several hundred or several thousand people, then there are possibilities to do things that I have found have made extraordinary differences in a lot of the places where such meetings have happened. My friend and comrade Kelly Gillespie had an amazing meeting for a bunch of us to gather around uh, the Atlantic uh, in South Africa to talk about abolition in the specific context both of South Africa and of places like Brazil and Argentina and, and so on, right? To just to do things and to have the moment to think about what activists are doing, what scholars are doing, what thinkers are doing, how it might work all together, and how people who inhabit many of those different categories can get better at what they do. Um, why case studies? It's because it's a slog, because I'm really kind of sick of people pretending that abolition, or thinking, maybe they're not pretending, maybe it's all genuine, that what abolition is is saying, no, it's not. Abolition is making a world, right? Abolition is all about changing the world. They have a whole discussion in something else about, about places in which that kind of change you know, is realized and why Du Bois called what happened in the kind of radical communities of the U.S. South during radical reconstruction, abolition democracy. So some of you have read Angela Davis's book. Go back and read Black Reconstruction in America, which you have to read if you want to be educated. <laughs> um, so that's why the case studies. And, 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 to, to, and the, the purpose of the case studies is not to particularize those cases and say, here and only here could this thing happen, but rather look at what people did over time, sometimes prepared, sometimes taken by surprise, to achieve something um, that wasn't necessarily on the agenda when they first started doing whatever it is they were doing. I mean, the labor union people weren't thinking about prison abolition. The abolitionists weren't thinking uh, necessarily about environmental justice and, and so forth, right? This is how popular fronts happen. That's, that's, that's why the case studies, and that's why the case studies now. Um, not in our name and improved conditions. I have never said, nor will I ever say, improving conditions is not a good thing. But I will say, Rikers was built to improve conditions from Roosevelt Island. Folsom was built to improve conditions of San Quentin. I mean, Come on, they build a new building. The new building, the first day, does not have the weaknesses the old building had. That is true. It's a building. The relationships is what matter, right? The, I agree with you. I agree with you about uh, sentencing law. People are working now all over the United States 
trying to get rid of money bail, mm -hmm. right? So that people are not held in detention pending trial. And I mentioned earlier how much a life can be turned upside down, interrupted by a day, right? A day off the radar can end, thing, end things for people. So the improving conditions, making things clean, making certain that everybody who is in prison has adequate health care, of course they should. Of course they should. I recall some years ago a young person, a young progressive person, in fact, asking me, well, what is it, what is the prison moratorium project do? Are you just thinking it's just going to get so bad that, you know, spontaneously everything will just blow up? Like, you know, it's like they thought abolition was some kind of catastrophism, right? And I thought, well, I better explain that. So what I do is I explain, I explain, I explain, I explain, I explain. So the case studies are an example of, of trying to explain. Um, uh, and certainly not rejecting anything that will uh, enhance the possibility that somebody who, because they're in a cage, is already likely to have a shorter life than somebody not in a cage, and they're like the outliers that people can bring up uh, that, that are the exceptions to the rule, that that life isn't shortened even more from the fact of being in a cage. But what I want to emphasize is people should not be in cages. Um, and the scale of struggle is, is one that, uh, that matters enormously, you know, in this present moment um, in a variety of ways. So Dwayne Betts asked me about top down. The fact is the President of the United States cannot make any state do anything. The jurisdictions are separate, right? About 10% of all the people locked up in the United States are locked up in federal prisons, jails, and detention centers. Everybody else is in a state or county or city prison or jail. The, 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 the laws governing them are separate. The reason people went through federal courts to get relief under conditions of confinement had to do with the particular ways the Constitution was used in the 20th century to change political relationships. The Constitution seems not that useful today, as useful today as it was in the middle to the late 20th century. I mean, perhaps you're going to become a constitutional lawyer and prove me wrong. Right. All right. So, the sovereignty of states when it comes to criminal law is absolute except for when they cross certain lines. And the preponderance of decisions coming out of the United States Supreme Court show that that line is going further and further and further away from anything that we would recognize as reformist reform, much less abolition. So that was the thing that was so shocking about the decision about the California perpetual death machine which I want to remind you is public, 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 public um, uh, prison system. So what can the federal government do to the state governments? Not much. What can the state governments do to the county governments? A bit more. What can we do to connect struggles across time and space? The most. And that's what we should do. And I have a feeling that that says shut up. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to just shut, let me just put something up and I'll let it speak for itself. No, no, it doesn't say shut up. Okay, it doesn't say shut up. I've had a strike. All right. right. Um, that's Eric Garner's eyes. But that's not what I want to show you. I want to show you this. Um,